Good afternoon, everyone, and a big welcome from the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust and the Australian Museum. My name is Coral Latella, and I am the Communications and Education Officer at the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, or the BCT. We are really excited to have you here with us in this webinar all about how to monitor for frog and ecosystem health on your land through the Australian Museum's Frog ID app. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land which we are all meeting on, on today, recognising their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. I'm here in beautiful Gadigal and Bidjigal country in Coogee, Sydney, and I know we have people calling in from right across the country. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So today is about celebrating a new partnership between the BCT and the Australian Museum on their Frog ID Citizen Science Project, but more importantly, supporting Frog ID Week and discussing all things frogs. We are honoured to have with us Alice McGrath from the BCT and Professor Chris Helgen and Dr Jodie Rowley from the Australian Museum. But before I introduce our guests, I want to let you know that at the end of the presentation, there will be a 10 minute Q&A session. There's a chat window on the side of your screen. So if you have anything you'd like to ask of Dr. Jodie Rowley, use the Q&A function to submit your questions and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. Now I'll hand over to Alice McGrath, Senior Education Officer at the Biodiversity Conservation Trust to explain a little more about who the BCT is and what this partnership with the Australian Museum is all about. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Coral, and a big welcome to you all, particularly to our BCT landholders who are joining us from across the state and to our partners as well. So for those of you who haven't heard of the BCT, the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust, we're a statutory not-for-profit body established in 2017 under the Bio Biodiversity Conservation Act. The BCT's vision is to have vibrant private land conservation areas, protecting our unique and diverse plants and animals across New South Wales. We do this by partnering with landholders to enhance and conserve the biodiversity on their properties. And another large part of what the BCT does is to promote public knowledge, appreciation and understanding of biodiversity and the importance of conserving it. And we do this through the many projects delivered under our education program, which is what I focus on. In this new supporting partnership with the Australian Museum's Frog ID team, that's just one such project. Through the partnership, we'll be providing information and tools to our landholders to help monitor and conserve the frogs on their land and local areas. And if you have an agreement with the BCT, stay tuned for more Frog ID resources and events happening in early 2022, alongside a range of other conservation management webinars and resources, which will be delivered by our BCT education team in the coming year. The BCT are proud supporters of Frog ID Week, and we encourage you all to check out the Frog ID website to get involved in the project and other events and activities happening over the next week. And if you'd like to know more about the work of the BCT and how to get involved, you can visit the BCT website, which we'll be putting up on the screen at the end of the webinar. Thanks everyone, enjoy, and over to you, Coral. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. I'll now hand over to Professor Chris Helgen, Chief Scientist and Director of the Australian Museum Research Institute to give a little overview about how Frog ID contributes to the important research led by the museum. Alrighty, seems like we don't have Chris online yet, or he may have be <laughs> may be having some technical difficulties. So we'll come back to Chris. So why don't we go to Dr. Jody Rowley? Um, Jody is, bear with me. <laughs> I need to get her title right. <laughs> Beautiful. So. Jody is the Curator of Amphibian and Reptile Biology Conservation at the Australian Museum Research Institute and UNSW Sydney. So Jody will be presenting on how to monitor frog and ecosystem health on your land using Frog ID. Thanks, Jody. 
Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, my favourite things on earth, and that is frogs. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and, and thank you so much to the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust. So I'm going to start, I guess, right at the big picture, Australia's frogs. Uh, we are lucky enough to have over 240 native species of frog in Australia, um, which is is pretty remarkable. And they, you know, vary from frogs that are like tiny little fingernail size to to really sort of entire hand sized frogs. And we actually, uh, I say generally over 240 because we actually don't know how many frog species we have in Australia, which I always find kind of alarming, but also exciting at the same time, because we're still in an age of, of discovery with Australia's frogs. And in the last month, there was two new species to science described from Australia, one of them from New South Wales. Uh, so the little pictures of the frogs uh, with the yellow around uh, are two species that have been described. Gummel's at the top uh, is own, it's not known in, in alive. No one's had a photo of it alive. It's only known from museum specimens and it's only been seen by scientists once. That's from uh, the Wessel Islands off the coast of the Northern Territory. And then we have the little Wollombun pouched frog, um, which has been described from uh, Mount Wollombun or Mount Warning in Northern New South Wales just recently. So only just in this one very small area. Um, now, we don't have the greatest track record in frog conservation. We've already at least lost at least four species to extinction, including frogs like the remarkable gastric brooding frog, which used to actually lay eggs and then protect their babies by eating them, turning off their stomach acid so that they didn't get dissolved. Uh, and then they would just sort of hop around with these little frogs that would turn into little tadpoles and little, little baby frogs, then open their mouth and their little baby frogs would pop out of their mouth after uh, a little while, which is remarkable. Unfortunately, the two species of gastric brooding frog we have, um, we, we, know, we no longer have. And there was an article in the media this week that went to try and survey some more remote areas looking for one of the species of gastric brooding frog and didn't find it. Um, so he still thought to be extinct, unfortunately. And we have 36 species threatened with extinction as well. New South Wales is blessed to have a lot of really absolutely amazing frogs. So about 86 species and 29 of these are threatened with extinction. Uh, we also have uh, one endangered population, and that is the tusked frog from the New England and Nandawa uh, bioregions, which I'll talk a little bit about later. That's a remarkable frog. What are the threats facing frogs? So uh, habitat modification is, is a big threat to frogs. A lot of species, not all, but a lot of species are really adapted to specific kind of environmental conditions. So when things change, occasionally, you know, they're not able to persist. Introduce species, so whether that's cats, foxes, pigs, sort of rummaging around, um, in breeding habitat uh, or fish, introduce fish like trout and carp. Climate change, which is already impacting frogs and disease, which is a really big thing that you might have seen in the news this winter uh, as well. Um, the primary disease uh, that, that I guess has been the biggest threat to Australia's frogs, at least until now, uh, is a disease called chytridiomycosis, which is caused by the amphibian chytrid fungus. Uh, now, this was first discovered in dead and dying frogs in the 90s, but we believe it arrived here from overseas in the 1970s or so, and it's really widespread. It invades the frog skin, which is sort of like the Achilles heel of frogs. Uh, they have, you know, they breathe through their skin, they drink through their skin. And so when something affects their skin, then it, it really affects the whole frog. And so um, it has driven um, population declines and extinctions in Australia's frog species. And it's still a major contributing factor to sort of death in in Australia's frogs. Now this, this winter, we have witnessed dead and dying frogs across Australia, but particularly in New South Wales, particularly Northern New South Wales, but all over. Um, we suspect in this case that it is disease. And we believe that this uh, amphibian chytrid fungus that's causing chytridiomycosis is playing a part. Um, and we're 
we're investigating at the Australian Museum and the, through the Frog ID team as well, uh, working with Taronga's Australian Registry of Wildlife Health to try and get to the bottom of what is actually causing this mortality event. But it definitely has not been a good winter for Australia's frogs. Uh, the overarching question, I, mean, I guess, why, why do we care? Um, what does it matter if Australia's frogs start to disappear, um, if we lose species? And uh, I guess at the most simple level, frogs are meant to be, and they are in healthy ecosystems, incredibly abundant. Uh, so their biomass, the kind of volume of frogs in an ecosystem, even though the frogs themselves are often really tiny, if you kind of made these imaginary piles in your head of all the different animals in, in an ecosystem, in many ecosystems, the frog pile would actually be the biggest, uh, which I guess makes it then not surprising that when this, this biomass starts to be reduced, that it has really big flow on impacts throughout ecosystems. Frogs are vital at connecting aquatic ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems. So energy flows and nutrient dynamics, you know, frogs lay their eggs, which is a, a source of energy into freshwater systems. They're tadpoles, uh, that typically then they are vegetarian, they eat a lot of algae and then they metamorphose and turn onto land. Uh, so the energy then sort of flows back onto land and it's a, it's a bit of a really important cycle. They're a key part of food webs. So frogs themselves and tadpoles are delicious and they are eaten by an enormous amount of other animals, birds, mammals, reptiles. And so, so they're sort of supporting uh, the whole ecosystem around them. And they also eat a lot of things. So uh, frogs themselves eat a lot of invertebrates, including pest species, and tadpoles uh, eat a lot of algae in particular. And so we know what happens when frogs disappear from ecosystems, from some of the places where they have. And you notice all the animals that rely on frogs for food start to then disappear as well. Streams clog up with algae and no other animal fills the role of frogs. So we know that even decades after dramatic frog population declines in Central America, that the ecosystems are forever altered, that nothing kind of fills the place of frogs. We need frogs. Now, if, if that isn't convincing enough, there are some selfish reasons that we should want frogs around. So Australian frogs, in particular, the photo here is the, the holy cross frog noted in Benatai, the big yellow, black and, um, and red spotted frog, which is one of Australia's most beautiful frogs, in my opinion. Uh, that's producing a goo on its skin. It's puffing up and there's a goo. And that goo has actually been investigated for use in human medicine. So the glue that these frogs produce on their skin to stop them from getting eaten um, to gum up the sort of snake's mouth is actually being used, for example, uh, to uh, for cartilage repair in human surgery because the glue is as sticky as it is wet as when it's dry, which is kind of remarkable. But there's a whole host of other chemicals that frogs produce on their skin to stop them from getting infected by things, antifungals, antibacteria, antivirals, anti-carcinogenics. So all sorts of things um, that we can maybe learn how to create drugs to help save us in the future. And every time we lose a frog species, we lose these, uh, I guess, ingenious chemical recipes that the frogs have developed uh, to maybe help save ourselves the next time. And lastly, uh, frogs are fantastic bioindicators. So most species, not all, but most species of frog, uh, they are so sensitive to any kind of environmental change that we can actually use frogs to monitor the health of our ecosystem. So we don't have to measure everything. We can just assess how our frogs are doing. And that gives us a bit of a proxy of how particularly freshwater habitats, but habitats in general uh, are going. One of the challenges we face in making sure we don't lose any more frog species is that we actually don't know that much about them. Now, I've already said that we don't even have how many species of frog we have in Australia, which I, I think is very much insane. Um, but we also have huge parts of Australia where there are no official records of frogs in existence. So no scientific records of frogs. This is a screen cap that I took from the Atlas of Living Australia, just to show you in general, you can see Sydney, Newcastle, there's, there's some decent number of samples. Someone must have been surveying out Ningen and gone up and down all the roads out of Ningen also. Um, that's one area that, that shows up. But there are areas of New South Wales 
not that far from Sydney that are hundreds of kilometres with no official frog records. And when it comes to then land use planning, where where we need to, I guess, you know, potentially create new protected areas, uh, what impact will particular kinds of land use have, then we have this huge gap in knowledge. And it's not just as simple as going out there and doing a survey, uh, because a lot of frogs, particularly in these more arid areas, they might only pop above ground and call and be obvious to anyone doing a survey uh, for a few days a year. So we desperately need these records so that we can consider frogs in, in land use decisions. And that is where Frog ID comes in. So Frog ID was created to try and get the information that we need to help better inform land use and frogs themselves. And it's all based around two things. So one is that we all have this amazing piece of technology, most of us, uh, in our back pockets. It records calls that previously, you know, you used to have to record audio, you used to have half of your back seat full. You know, I know these early frog biologists that just had all their sound recording equipment filling up half their car. Now we're very guiltily, I can have that capacity just in my back pocket, which is really amazing. So we've got this amazing piece of technology that is a GPS, that is a sound recorder, uh, and that has time and date and everything. So it makes it super easy. And the other thing is that frogs call. So every species of frog has a different call. And so simply by pressing record uh, using the Frog ID app, we're able to get a really fantastic sort of uh, audio grab um, with the date and the time and everything associated with it that can then be identified to species. So you don't have to know what the frog is, you don't have to handle the frog, and certainly that's something that is very, very important to the Frog ID project because frogs are so affected by disease and because they're so sensitive. And also frogs are incredibly difficult, many species to identify by appearance. Um, all you need to do is just capture these love songs so it's male frogs calling to attract female frogs and submit them to the project. So what do we get? Once you get the app, so you can actually look at the app, you can see all the frogs, you can narrow it down by near me, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later, so that you can just see the frogs likely to occur in your area. So it's, a, it's an up-to-date field guide. As soon as new species are described, they're in the app. Um, but the main thing is this tool for recording frogs and contributing to the national database. So um, what we get uh, is a recording. Um, so we can play it. This is a recording uh, that I've submitted to Frog ID uh, from the Northern Tablelands of New South Wales. Now, I was in a creek that uh, didn't have any records of frogs in existence uh, and I had no mobile reception, which is another thing that's, I guess, a really important part of Frog ID. Uh, creepily or otherwise, your phone actually know where you are even when you're out of mobile reception, which is fantastic. So I was down a gorge, made a recording, um, this recording is of a red-back toadlet, Sidophony coriacea, and it was calling away. Um, associated with this is the latitude, the longitude, um, and the accuracy. I didn't submit any photos, but I could. I didn't submit any notes, but I definitely can. And I've recorded that it was in a natural area and in a stream and a creek. Uh, and so we get all this information just by pressing record on your phone for 20 seconds. This is an incredibly important important scientific record. So Frog ID has been going for just over four years. Now, when we first launched, I wasn't sure if it was, you know, I guess how much people cared about frogs, how much people would take part in this project. And I am delighted to tell you that we have had an amazing number of people contribute to an amazing volume of data that's actually a complete game changer when it comes to frog conservation. So the map of Australia has little red dots and they are all records of frogs calling that have been submitted to the Frog ID project. So almost 30,000 people have contributed audio. Hundreds of thousands of people have downloaded the app, but over 30, sort of around 30,000 people have contributed audio of frogs uh, resulting in almost, and now we're actually at 488,000 and, and this is how quickly we're going up, we're going to hit half a million frog records in four years, which will essentially double 
the number of records of frogs, the number of scientific records of frogs that we had before Frog ID. And this is absolutely amazing. And not only uh, is it sort of a volume of data, but remember each one of these recordings has the GPS latitude and longitude. It has the time and date stamp and it has an audio recording associated with it. So it is very, uh, very museum, museum-y. You know, we have a lot of, um, we have evidence. We have evidence of what frogs are calling where. Uh, and 205 species we're at at the moment. So there are many species still some in really remote places or frogs, unfortunately, that we think are extinct, but we're still holding out that we might actually get that audio in the future. The popularity of frog ID and the volume of recordings that have been coming in are going up over time. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're actually, I'm sure we've only in the few days since I exported this data on Monday, I'm sure we've shot right up for this month because Frog ID Week is absolutely going off. Uh, we're about to hit uh, 10,000 submissions uh, in Frog ID Week already, which will um, yeah, be absolutely amazing. Uh, and in terms of the species, uh, the, I guess the, there are some species that are recorded way more than others. And the most commonly recorded species is the Crinia signifera, which is not the frog there on the right. Um, that's a red-backed toadlet. Um, but this frog species had very few actually records that existed before Frog ID because it's a tiny little frog that calls its heart out. So it's often heard, but it's almost never seen. Um, they're really, really tricky to find. Um, and so these guys uh, who are also quite common in rural and suburban areas um, are recorded far more than, than many others. Now, New South Wales has by far the most uh, number of frog records resulting from frog ID. So uh, we've got an amazing uh, number of people in New South Wales that are recording frogs like crazy. And you can see the map on the left where I've mapped all of the frog ID records just in New South Wales. Now, this is absolutely amazing. This is fantastic. Uh, but you can also see there are still huge parts of New South Wales that are yet to have frogs mapped. So we desperately, desperately need records um, from the places where we've got them, but also from as much of New South Wales as possible. And zooming in a little further as well, you can see just how um, just how many gaps we have, and that's sort of Dubbo in the in the the top um, middle of that as well. There's a lot of frog ID records from from places, but we need put more people um, in more places to definitely be putting frogs on the map for us. So. These records are great, but what are they telling us? What are we finding? And that's one of the things about Frog ID is that and if you want to check out on the Frog ID website, we have a science page that has all of the scientific publications that we've produced so far. Um, but this information is helping us, for example, find disappearing frogs. So the green tree frog used to be really common throughout Sydney. And within the first year, what Frog ID revealed to us was that the green tree frog has all but disappeared from most of Sydney. Um, and so we previously suspected this because we weren't seeing many green tree frogs around, but to have all these records across Sydney showing that there were no tree frogs, uh, green tree frogs or very few green tree frogs was the first data we had, which is now making us think, okay, what can we do to bring green tree frogs back to Sydney? It's also getting us an amazing number of threatened species records, which are so important, not only in informing the conservation of the species themselves, but also in, in understanding where are the priority areas and, and where are the priority places for frogs. Uh, and so, for example, Sloan's champions down in Albury, Wodonga in particular, they have increased the number of records of the tiny little winter breeding Sloan's froglet. Uh, by several folds since the start of Frog ID, which has really changed the game for conservation in, in this little frog. Through Frog ID and the data that everybody's recording of frogs, um, we're getting an understanding of climate change, the impact of drought, the impact of fires. Uh, so I was absolutely terrified after the 2019 and 20 bushfires for Australia's frogs. I was raring to get out there and go see how our frogs were doing. Uh, and then COVID hit and we were in lockdowns. And it was only thanks to people out there with the Frog ID app on their properties and in their adjacent areas 
recording frogs that helped give us some fantastic news. And that was that Australia's frogs were calling after the fires across the fire zone. So there was widespread persistence of Australia's frogs, uh, which you don't often get good news when it comes to frog conservation. So this was an amazing, um, amazing bit of news. It was only thanks to people out there using their phone to record frog calls because the frog biologist was stuck at home. And to my knowledge, this was the first paper with data that came out about the impact of these fires on Australia's biodiversity. So uh, some really amazing results. Uh, we're also doing research in the team, particularly led by Gracie Liu on the impact of land use change. And we're finding that there's, uh, I guess, an overriding um, intolerance of frogs to uh, urbanisation or habitat modification. Um, for example, uh, when you look at Australia's sort of greater um, sort of city areas and compare it to the adjacent, more natural, less modified areas, uh, we found that uh, the species diversity, the number of frog species was only about 70% in the cities than it was a, a, compared to the adjacent um, areas. So uh, it's helping us prioritise uh, the frogs that are very, very intolerant that we're identifying and also try and learn well, what are the areas within suburban, are um, suburban areas that actually are supporting more frogs and how can we make more of these? Frog ID is also helping track invasive species like the cane toad, and it's also helping discover new species. So simply by listening to the calls and analysing the calls, we're picking up species of frogs that either we know we've, we've since people, other scientists around Australia have since published our new species like Spalding's rocket frog, uh, or we're investigating um, potential new species, which is really exciting. The data from Frog ID is being integrated into all this kind of conservation research and you can check out more um, on the link there. So we've got a number of papers out. Uh, it's also put into state and, and territory wildlife atlases and into the National Biodiversity Aggregate, the Atlas of Living Australia. So the data is going to inform conservation exactly where it's meant to go. Um, it's also recommended that you use Frog ID in the New South Wales Survey Guide guidelines for threatened frogs and it's incorporated that frog ID is used in many federal conservation assessments so it's a great non-invasive way of monitoring our amazing amphibians. Now frog conservation and private lands more broadly than just frog ID and private lands is, is something that I'm incredibly passionate about and it's very clear that biodiversity on private lands often differs from that on public lands. Um, and most endangered species or threatened species rely, at least in part, and some entirely, on habitats on private land. Now, around 62% of Australia is privately owned, so it's incredibly important. And it's clear that biodiversity conservation um, and biodiversity sampling on private lands is essential. To give you a little story about this, I've been looking with some of my team for a tiny frog on the New England Tablelands of New South Wales for about six years now. This is the peppered tree frog and that photograph was taken by Marion Anstis and, and that is the photograph that is used because this frog hasn't been seen uh, for more than 40 years. It was known only from the area sort of uh, near Armadale and to Glen Innes particularly around Glen Innes. And uh, I started a project with the support of the New South Wales Environmental Trust uh, about six years ago looking for this frog. And particularly me and my, my colleague, Timothy Kitea, we were going up and down gorges in, I understand why it's called the Eastern Falls country, because this is a photograph of us at about a thousand metres elevation. We would climb down at night into these national parks, into these gorges at 400 metres elevation, survey for frogs, for several hours and then climb back out until we almost collapsed. And we did several years where we focused almost exclusively in protected areas in national parks and in state forests. And we didn't actually uh, find the pepper tree frog. Then after a little while, we started shifting our attention to private lands and we asked landholders if they would be willing to let us look for the pepper tree frog. And in fact, almost all of the known locations of the pepper tree frog from 40 years ago are on private lands. 
And we did a lot of surveys, which was absolutely amazing on private land, and we continue to do so. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you the good news that we found the pepper tree frog. I sincerely believe this frog is still out there. Um, and it's probably on private land. Uh, but in the course of our surveys, we actually rediscovered the Burralong frog on the northern tablelands of New South Wales, which also hadn't been seen uh, for, for more than 40 years. Now, this, this frog species is known a little further south, more than 100 kilometres away down near Tamworth on the lower slopes, but it, there was absolutely no records for 40 years since the 1970s across the, the high elevation, the northern Tablelands bioregion. And since then, we've been surveying around and this frog, oh, this population, the New England population of the Burralong frog, which is endangered, is exclusively, as far as we know, on private property. Um, and so its conservation is, de is definitely um, in the hands of some amazing landholders. Um, and so this, this, I guess, it's very close to my heart. And, you know, Frog ID is actually really, really been fantastic at getting records from private lands. So only 9% of frog ID records are actually from protected areas. And in New South Wales, the, the number's even lower, so around 5%. This, this compares to around 24% uh, of museum specimens from, that are collected from protected areas. And so uh, frog ID is amazing at getting information on biodiversity across Australia and across New South Wales, in part because it's often people on their own properties just recording frogs. And people on private properties recording frogs have resulted in huge range extensions. For example, in the Northern Territory, uh, simple recording just a couple of metres from the porch resulted in over a 100 kilometre range extension for uh, the striped rocket frog. So simple recordings sort of make scientific leaps and bounds. And Frog ID was also crucial in helping also rediscover the endangered tusk frog population uh, on the New England Tablelands and Amanda bioregion as well near Tenterfield. So recordings uh, were submitted of this characteristic little chirp that again hadn't been seen um, or reported by scientists for more than 40 years. But that frog was just chirping away on private property, which is really remarkable and I think shows the power of Frog ID and people on private lands in conservation. So what can you do? Now, not surprisingly, uh, a lot of what I will recommend, and I'll, I'm happy to answer as many questions as possible towards the end, but uh, the sort of things I recommend in terms of learning in, about the frogs on your property and understanding frogs is to learn about your local frogs, including threatened species. And so I think one of the best ways to do that is to get the frog ID up, of course, and filter it so there's a sort of a filter option for looking at the frogs and select near me. And what that will bring up is a list of frogs that are mapped around your area. So they might not be on your property, but they're in your vicinity. And that way you can have a look. You can scroll through, listen to the frog calls, see what kind of noises they make, understand whether they're, they're threatened or not. Now, if you have threatened species that need your help in the area and you're not sure you know, if, if they um, occur on your property, um, then it, it would be great to sort of understand their habitat needs and threats. If the frog likes rocky creeks, do you have rocky creeks? Um, are they, you know, willow trees, for example, can um, uh, put their roots and sort of silt up the kind of cracks in these rocks that frogs like to, to lay their eggs in. So you can learn a bit about the frogs that may occur on your property. And then get out there and survey for your frogs. So press record on the Frog ID app whenever you hear a frog and record for at least 20 seconds and submit that. So um, different frog species will call at different times of year. So just because you go to a place, you know, in, in one month, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a species that might call it at different times of year. So repeat recordings over time are really, really important. Frogs are also notoriously fiddly about when they call. They're very picky. And so if the weather's not right, sometimes the frog just won't call. So repeat visit sites if you really want to know what frogs are where. 
most species do breed in Eastern Australia in particular at this time of year, but there are species that will only call in winter and species that prefer spring and autumn. Um, and so, you know, or, or that need absolutely torrential rain, for example. So uh, definitely repeat visits are important. The best time to survey for frogs is typically the first few hours after dark, although there are many frog species that will call during the day. And obviously after rains is good. Uh, frogs that call from ponds and temporary sort of flooded areas obviously love it um, after heavy rain. Frogs that breed in streams and creeks will often not call then because their habitat has turned into a raging torrent that will probably send them out to sea. And so they will typically hop away from the stream. And when the water levels get down a little bit, then they'll potentially hop back up. So get out there and, and survey your frogs, definitely. And then tailor your land management if you can, if you particularly if you find some some threatened frog species or some rarer frog species, and, and you sort of know the kinds of things that these frogs will like, uh, then you know switch things up. Um, and and it really depends. I guess there's no overarching things that different frogs that you can say for all frogs. Obviously, uh, waterways are pretty important for frogs, so. Um, you know, keeping those waterways, including the kind of temporary waterways are going to be really important. Um, but different frogs like different things. And so I guess there's no one overarching, um, uh, I guess, statements that you can make. Uh, but I, your frogs will tell you. Uh, so if you keep monitoring your frogs and you're doing things right, then your frogs will just keep going really fantastically. So you can get a really great understanding of how you're doing um, that way as well. And with that, I would love to accept um, questions. I think we might uh, hopefully chat to Professor Professor Chris Helgen, uh, a little bit more about the, the Research Institute in general, and then we will accept any questions about frogs and frog ID. But frog ID week is on now, so this is definitely the most important time to get out there recording, uh, and it runs until midnight on Sunday. So please get out there and help us get this really intense snapshot that we need to help understand how frogs are doing over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jodie, for that insight into the threats our frogs are currently facing and what each of us can do to help protect our local populations living on our properties and in our backyards. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get Professor Chris Helgen online today. So that means we can jump straight to questions. So I'll start filtering them through Jodie. Um, so the first one is, what has been the response to Frog ID Week this year? Amazing. So we've had, I think today, with a bit of luck and a few more recordings from everyone out there, we will hit 10,000, um, which is absolutely amazing. So you can check on the Frog ID website, which I will actually do now. So we've actually got a Frog ID Week section. So we've had 9,000, like this is as of this second, because we are getting them in, 9,534 recordings submitted, which has so far resulted in 7,553 records of frogs. We're, we've still got so many uh, to go through. So that number will keep going up for a while. And 81 species so far, which is absolutely amazing. So we're about to smash last year's record um, and we, we want to keep going because with any luck we'll actually hit half a million records of frogs thanks to frog id week which yeah which would basically double the number of records in existence of frogs which is all thanks to everyone's help out there awesome thanks jody so the next one is from wendy um, we have fenced livestock out of our creeks, so the grass grows really tall and thick along the waterway. Is this good or bad for the frogs trying to move around? Probably overall good. It, um, you know, certainly livestock and frogs can certainly mix uh it's not sort of a, a one or the other type thing and certainly in fact the endangered burlong frogs that i find up on the northern tablelands of new south wales do exist with livestock uh and um i suppose it's a bit of a balancing act frogs 
don't mind some bare rock in the streams, but that's probably still existing. Uh, it depends a little what species you have. Overall, a good thing, uh, but I guess keep, keep monitoring your frogs. And if you keep using frog ID over time, you'll be able to get an understanding if the grass gets too super crazy and, and you start hearing less and less frogs, then potentially you let, let the cattle or, or whatever livestock in for a little bit, get the grass down and, and then maybe fence it off again. Uh, the next one is from Karen. Does frog ID still work if there are multiple frogs calling at the same time? Definitely, yes. Yeah. So I think the the average number of frogs calling in submissions with frogs, it used to be 2.2. I think it's actually a little bit higher at the moment, especially in, in summer and frog ID week. We have been able to identify 12 or 13 species calling in a recording. So if you get a good rain, particularly out in Western Queensland, absolutely every frog that exists just goes for it at once. And so you'll get a lot of frogs calling at the same time. Uh, and so uh, I guess an important point to note, and maybe I didn't emphasize enough, is that it is all humans like myself that are listening to every single submission that you send in. So it's not a frog shazam, it's not artificial intelligence yet. Um, and so you'll record will be listened to by at least one frog expert um, and, and that's the other cool thing about frog id so if you have questions as well as answering them here and as well as emailing the frog id email you you know if you if you hear something weird in your coding you, you want to ask something specifically um, then you can ask that in your frog id submission when there's a section to write notes you could ask a question about it and one of us the, the person that listens to your recording at least one of us will be able to reply to you as well so it's that interaction between the frog scientists as well and 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 you out there recording frogs Awesome. Uh, this one's from uh, Megan or Megan. Uh, since the data on frog species has double has been doubled, what frog conservation action is now taking place as a result? For example, land use, educating landholders to preserve habitat on their land for biodiversity, etc. And she also says thank you and well done and a great achievement. Thank you. Well, it's it's really honestly thanks to everybody out there recording frogs. Uh, I've I've recorded quite a few, but I'm definitely not contributing that much um, compared compared to everyone else out there. Uh, so the data is being used to inform uh, land management, sort of mostly through its sort of incorporation into the wildlife atlases, and so we don't get get direct feedback on that. I think one of the most, I guess. There's a couple of really good examples of how it's being used. Uh, so, for example, the Sloan's Champions, which are down in Albury, Wodonga, have been going out there uh, and you know they're working with local land services and New South Wales DPI sort of coordinating this effort. But it's just uh, it's a bunch of local guys out there trying to document their little threatened frogs that were really poorly documented before. Um, so the, the conservation assessment of that frog now, it's, it's sort of been upgraded and it's, it's officially endangered at uh, a national level. And they're, we're, they're getting a much better understanding that this frog is actually much more restricted now than it used to be. So there's been a lot of recordings in the area and uh, we used to think it was much more widespread, um, but it isn't. Um, but they, they're just doing a lot of on the ground conservation efforts. And I, I believe a lot of those recordings are from private land from and they, they're kind of just like calling in a paddock. They're a bit of a funny frog that calls during the middle of winter in flooded paddocks. So they're doing a lot of on the ground action. So it's really community led. Another instance is the magnificent brood frog on um, the Athena Tablelands of North Queensland and the local community around there has just realised that this frog, a lot of it's, um, no one's actually seen this frog at a lot of the places that it used to occur. So they've all decided, right, that's it. The Cape York Natural History Society has got the Frog ID app and they're going and revisiting all of these sites to try and see whether this frog is actually still there. And uh, I think that, that that frog will also realise that that's actually disappeared a lot. But it's sort of empowering local communities to, to get the information they need. We also have uh, other organisations and, and other landholders, large landholders that incorporate Frog ID into to their monitoring of uh, their rewatering efforts and things like that. So they get out there every year and they're assessing the, um, I guess, the impact of their management regime and their changes in management on frog populations as part of their overall sort of biodiversity monitoring. Uh, and 
Uh, you can request as well as part of Frog ID that, you know, you would like all of the data from your land exported in sort of a format that lets you understand how you're doing on your land as well. So um, the, the data is, is can be used by you to, to monitor your land and you can also log into Frog ID, see all your recordings, see all your data as well. Great. Uh, this one's from Joel. If there was one place in New South Wales that you would want someone to submit a frog ID record, where would that be? Um, ooh, that's that's near impossible. More than one place, I guess. I would love I would love to hear a frog that we think is extinct or we're worried is extinct. So something like mm. the yellow spotted bell frog. Uh, you know, if we hear that little motorbike sounding call from somewhere, I mean, I just don't believe some of these species really are extinct. There's so much country out there. Uh, there's so few records of frogs comparatively. Uh, so rather than, I guess, a place, well, particularly the New England tablelands of New South Wales, there's a, a, there's a bunch of missing species. And I think I very much hope, I pray that they're not missing and that somebody out there will just record the frogs in their dam and, and we'll, we'll realise that we haven't lost, you know, an amazing frog species from Australia. So that's my hope. Okay. Um, another one from Joel. What types of data do you collect as part of your field survey? And do you handle frogs or can you now rely on calls to identify or quantify species? Uh, a bit of both. So it depends what my field work is doing. So this is sort of, I guess, outside of frog ID. So I certainly do do a lot of frog ID recordings and, and don't touch frogs. In the part, in some of my research, we're looking at frog disease and we're looking at frog health. And so in that case, we would uh, handle frogs, but we are very conscious of hygiene. And that's one of the reasons that um, frog ID doesn't want you to you know touch frogs yourself but we certainly we're using sort of single use bags and sterilizing equipment between frogs because we don't want to transfer from one frog to the other but for the burlong frogs we swab them for their the disease and test it uh, and we weigh and measure them and we take photos of them because you can identify them by their unique little patterns so you can track an individual over time by just matching the little patterns it has on its skin um, and so for that kind of work we often do have scientific licenses and handle frogs but for a lot of the work that we do we honestly just use frog id now it's so easy you don't need a gps you don't need the professional call recording equipment and honestly i used to use this you know professional microphone professional gear but frog id recordings can be good enough to do really high quality kind of you know bioacoustic work so um, you can you can just do frog surveys by using frog id great uh karen is asking when is the best time to hear frogs now is pretty good although i wish it would warm up slightly and then it would be perfect uh so at any time of year you can hear frogs uh but probably the most number of species around about now the first few hours after dark are usually the best and after rain um is, is pretty good as well so for the most part we're hitting the mark in a lot of australia at the moment with with the rains uh i think tomorrow is meant to be a little warmer throughout much of new south wales anyway and so the frogs hopefully will be going off great um, Leanne is asking uh, about cane toads. She says, I have many cane toads on my property. I catch often 30 to 40 a night. Can you still hear frog calls amongst the noisy toads? Um, and she says, I have sent some records on frog ID. And she's wondering if there's any new research in how to get rid of cane toads. Uh, good question. So we actually do want records of cane toads as well um, because they have been vital in kind of understanding, you know, if, if occasionally a cane toad as well hitches a ride uh, and it gets moved outside of the range that it's moving on its own. And so we can detect that and we can notify, uh, you know, people around there to get out their local land services and try and make sure that we don't get cane toads established where they're not, not sort of moving themselves. Um, but we're also hoping to understand a little more about how cane toads arrival and how the abundance of cane toads affect frogs because there has been relatively little research so far. So it is really important to get records of cane toads. We can hear other frog species over cane toad records. Uh, that cane toads actually have quite a sweet call and it's quite quiet um, relative to a lot of our noisy Australian frogs so it's just that 
but it, it's a really great a great way of monitoring not only frogs but cane toads and they can be done at the same time. In terms of research, there's been quite a bit of research lately looking at traps for tadpoles, cane toad tadpoles, and using the kind of chemicals that the cane toad tadpoles secrete to actually attract the tadpoles of cane toads and trap them that way. Uh, but it's so tricky because cane toads are basically just frogs. And so anything that affects cane toads is likely to affect our native frogs as well. So um, we just need to make sure that we don't introduce any more non-native frogs or toads. And certainly we do get um, non-native toads and frogs that are detected at uh, ports and things like that. So that's another reason that we need frog ID to listen out for any other possible uh, introduced species of frog, which could be equally or more devastating. Phil is asking, um, he said, I was going to ask about AI, but you said that's still under development. Could you give a bit more info about how that can be used? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, the, the artificial intelligence is is coming forward in leaps and bounds in ter terms of image recognition uh, and in terms of audio recognition. And we are investigating that for, for use in Frog ID. Uh, at the moment, although we have the hugest database of frog calls that we can then use to train artificial intelligence. So we've got an amazing data set for that. Um, it's not as accurate as at, at this point in time um, as we need. Um, so accuracy is really important to us. Uh, and so it can be incredibly tricky, especially if you've got 12 frogs calling at one time, you know, some loud, some in the background. At the moment, us humans are actually better at identifying frog calls than artificial intelligence. But it's definitely something that we're exploring, as are many others. The other thing that we're exploring is public validation. So whether we can get everybody out there to help us listen to these frog calls. Uh, and so I guess stay tuned for, for more on that front as well. Andy is asking, do farm dams provide good frog, frog habitat and how can I maximise their habitat value? Great question. So farm dams are fantastic frog habitat and uh, I guess the more diversity of dams uh, on your property and the more kind of diversity of habitats, probably the more frogs that you're going to have. Aquatic vegetation as well as sort of any vegetation around the edge is really important for a lot of frogs. So if you've got some good reeds going um, and, and, you know, different varied depths and some bits with some vegetation along the side as well, you're likely to get many more species with some sort of trees around and things like that. Um, so definitely, in, in addition to farm dams, I think an area that where uh, I guess is often not considered as valuable for, um, for frogs are these kind of ephemeral, these really temporary kinds of habitat. So if you've got any areas of the property that are dry in the dry periods of year and then sort of flood temporarily or at least get water in them during rainy parts, they're actually really important as well because there are some frogs that will only breed in these kind of temporary waterways. Um, but yeah, farm dams are, are excellent. That sort of leads us into the next question from Jessie. Um, they're asking, if you can't build a pond in your backyard for frogs, what else can you do to encourage a healthy area for them? Good question. So uh, you can build a frog hotel for tree frogs. So frogs need shelter places too. So obviously for, for ground dwelling frogs, you could put rocks and, and things like that around or uh, some vegetation. Uh, you know, frogs like somewhere to be able to hide out, even if they're not breeding at your place. There are probably frogs that hop through your place. Um, you know, I built a pond in my backyard only a couple of months ago, and I don't think there are ponds around here. But we within the space of two months, I had a little frog find my pond. So they're clearly kind of hopping around and, and they're around the place. So making sure that it's a safe place for them to shelter, there's somewhere to sleep. Frog hotels can be just PVC pipes that are kind of put into the ground and tree frogs love sheltering inside them. Um, you might see see tree frogs sometimes if you look down any pipes that you have, um, you know, that the end caps fall off on your fence even, you might look down and see some some tree frogs in there or around your pool or things like that. Um, 
even I guess little bowls of water, uh, not having your cats particularly going out at night uh, because they will eat frogs and cats do eat a lot of frogs and minimising pesticides and chemicals used in your garden can all make your garden more frog friendly even if you don't have a pond. That's great. Um, Matt is asking, how long does it take between submitting a frog call and it being identified by your team? It really varies. Uh, so sometimes it can be pretty immediate. So sometimes I'll hop on and I'll just do the ones that people are submitting right now and so you'll get a notification. Um, at this point in time, there may be a slight delay because we have a huge number of, of frog calls coming in. But trust us, we we will let you know as soon as we validate it and every recording is important. But um, apologies, but you may have a little bit of a delay. We're working as hard as we can at the moment on those submissions and we'll continue to do so. Great. Um, Steve is asking, I have approached friends with properties with streams and dams to take recordings, but some are nervous that a rare finding might cause them a problem when discovered. Any comment on this possibility? That is a fantastic comment. Thank you. So uh, I guess there's a couple of layers to this. First of all, um, we buffer any sensitive species, so any threatened species records that come up in the public. So you might notice if you go to the Frog ID website and you look at the maps, um, everything comes up in a big grid because we only put things to one decimal place. Anyway, in, in the data sets that get released annually for any kind of threatened species, it's also only to one decimal place. Um, and so it, things, things are not accurately represented to the public of where threatened species are. And we do that both for private land, um, you know, reasons, we, we don't want um, people going in or, you know, the records being publicly available that way. Um, threatened frogs are very sensitive. We don't want people to go try and take photos of them or do anything like that. So um, the, the actual locations will not be showing up as they really are on, on the sort of non-public side of things. Um, and that, so that's important to us. Number two, typically uh, the only thing that will happen if you find a threatened species is uh, potentially more funding will open up for you to, if you were interested, do some land sort of improvement. So for example, I found the Burralong frog on a lot of private properties or, or on several private properties on the New England tablelands of New South Wales. Absolutely nothing has happened since those, you know, um, uh, the, you, for the landholders, but potentially if they were interested, for example, in fence, getting funding for fencing off streams or something like that, then they would be able to apply for funding and, and to get that to happen. But um, private land is private land. So yeah, it, 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 in, in my all my understandings of, of things and working with the community, um, it, it's not gonna change things. It will just excite us frog biologists that there are more <laughs> locations of some really cool frogs. Great. Um, we've only got time for a couple more. Stuart's asking, I've recorded at our home pond. How often should I repeat? Great question. So I think this is something we don't communicate enough in that just because you've recorded your pond once, um, please record at like once a day is great. Um, so even if it's the same frog calling away, I've been doing that because I only have one frog in my pond so far. I'm hoping there's more, um, but I record it every night that it's calling um, because it's not just understanding where our frogs are, but it's also when they breed. And so with this kind of repeat recordings over time, we can get a much better understanding of the breeding seasons of frogs uh, and how they respond to weather and climate, for example. So how might frogs breeding seasons change in the future? How are they already changing? Uh, what is prolonged drought gonna do for our frogs? All these kind of things require these repeat recordings over time. And especially during Frog ID week, every day, every day. <laughs> That's great. Um... We have one from Arthur. This will probably have to be the last one, I think. Um, are images sent in with the submitted audio data useful? Yes, we love images. So particularly images of habitat. So if particularly if you can if you're out there and it's not quite dark and you can get a decent shot of your pond or your dam or your creek, uh, then they can be really useful in helping us better understand the frogs and what kind of breeding habitat they have. Uh, and if you manage to see a frog that's calling, then it's really useful as well because uh, matching it with like the frog's appearance and the call can be really really telling. The difference, you know, when we're trying to see maybe that sounds a bit weird in this part of their range, could that be 
see a different species. If we can look at the frogs as well and go, wow, like they actually do look a bit different, then then it can really help us as well. And they're also great for sharing. Frogs are awesome. So we we don't. Um, it's not about just the photos. Uh, we definitely need the audio. Uh, but yeah, we love photographs too. So please keep keep them coming. Great. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much, Jody. What an excellent insight into Australia's frogs, how to monitor and manage for them, and how we can all contribute to their ongoing protection. Thanks also to Alice McGrath for participating in today's event. And thank you all for joining us today to hear more about how to monitor frog and ecosystem health on your land. So if you'd like to learn more about the BCT, uh, you'll see our website pop up on the screen and also to learn more about Frog ID and what other events and activities are happening as part of Frog ID Week, you can visit the Frog ID website, which is also on that screen. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.